Okay, well, good evening, everybody. I still have a lot of people trying to join, and that's great. I've got 630. So welcome to the Wyoming Bee College online conference. And tonight's speaker is Joe Comperda. Did I, Joe, did I pronounce that right? Close? Yep. There's nobody okay. that can compare to me. <laughs> there we go. And so tonight's program is, um, and this is, I asked Joe to do a program that was revolving around what I wish I had known when I started beekeeping. And so tonight's program is called Be Engaged, an average Joe's guide to what I wish I knew or beekeeping hints and tips. And so Joe is not quite your average beekeeper. He's a certified master beekeeper. He's been teaching at the Wyoming Bee College since 2018. So he's a um, seasoned veteran in the, in the teaching arena and knows his bees. And yes, this is being recorded. What I do is afterwards, I send it to my secretary and she tidies it up and <laughs> makes it look pretty. And then I post it on the Laramie County Extension webpage. So that's, that's University of Wyoming, Laramie County Extension webpage. And it will be available for anybody that wants to, to check it out. So we were talking, Joe and I were talking a little bit earlier. And if you've got a question, I will try to catch them down in chat. And if you want, I can also, um, you can raise your hand and ask a question or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. So tonight's focus is really gonna be towards helping beginners and helping you all really get to be good beekeepers and not make some of the classic errors. Although that still does happen. And so again, if you've got a question, you can raise your hand, which is uh, if you go down into, um, there's a little button down at the bottom for um, little things that you can put on your screen anyway. Um, Go ahead and ask a question, raise your hand, or just interrupt us. We're, we're good. We're going to be very informal tonight. So, Joe, with that, um, oh, one other thing um, for everybody that's out there listening to me. Um, if you would put in, please, your city and state or country that you're from, if you would put that into chat, if you would put in where you're from and, and where, you're, where you're listening. So I, I'd like to know, you know, that's, I think that's really a cool aspect of doing things by Zoom. And Joe, with that, I am going to turn the program over to you. So everybody, Joe Comperda on Be Engaged. Hey, Joe, you're muted. Okay, how about now? That looks much better. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. So thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. I always love to uh, be associated with the Wyoming Bee College. When I first started out about seven or eight years ago, uh, I found out about the Wyoming Bee College and uh, attended for a couple years as, as a student and, and, and learning. And then I got the opportunity to uh, actually uh, do a little teaching, and, and I really enjoy that. Uh, for about 20 years, I did adult education for a high-tech company and uh, mainly was teaching sellers how to sell software products. So I learned a little bit about teaching then. And uh, of course, when I found beekeeping uh, and found that you know people uh, need to learn more and more, I uh, jumped in and, and hopefully you'll enjoy what I have to share tonight. So with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get right into it. We're gonna try to take about 75 minutes tonight, a little over an hour. And of course, uh, with your questions, it may take a little longer, but uh, I'm willing to talk for hours about bees, but of course, people have to get off to other things. So I always start with a disclaimer, and I want to point out that the viewpoints that you're going to hear tonight are pers my personal viewpoints. They're based on me and my wife's beekeeping experience throughout seven seasons here on the Colorado Front Range. And even though I'm talking from Colorado, a, a lot of the stuff that happens all the way uh, from Denver all the way up to Cheyenne is very similar. So hopefully, even though beekeeping is local, 
and I'll mention that again time and time again. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll be a, a, apropos to most folks on the call tonight. Uh, as with most beekeeping activities, of course, if you ask three beekeepers, you'll get five different answers. And if you ask me, sometimes I'll give you three different answers depending. So with that, remember beekeeping is local. And so what's happening here isn't necessarily the same, same type of things that happen on the East Coast, the South California, et cetera. And very frankly, with the dry climate we have in Colorado and Wyoming for the most part, um, we can do things that a lot of other beekeepers in other parts of the country can't. So in a way, we are lucky to be here uh, and in a way that may also be a curse because when you're reading books, when you're reading information from other parts of the country, a lot of the things they say don't really apply. So you gotta kind of take things with a grain of salt. And with that, let's talk about what we're gonna get into tonight. Now, one of the things I learned early on as a beekeeper is there are all kinds of things that are truths, but those same truths can be myths and fables. And so tonight, I'm gonna kind of use those myths and fables to go through some of the things that I've learned over seven seasons of beekeeping and as an average Joe wanna share with other beekeepers out there. So, you know, everyone talks about saving the bees. An interesting one that we'll talk about a little bit later is fainting queens. This is really neat stuff and, and it's gonna be something cool to learn. And then of course, everyone wants to know about feeding bees and you know, know your honey, where is honey coming from? Um, one of the things that I heard early on was that the bees disconnect their wings in order to shiver to heat the hive. And it's like, how the heck do they disconnect the wings? We'll talk about that tonight. And then three inches or three miles, if you're gonna move your hive, you know, how do you move it? Oh, should you inspect your hive or not? A lot of people say, stay out of the hive and the bees will do just fine. Oh, laying workers, that's always a good subject to talk about. And then should you smoke or not smoke? And I'm not talking about smoking cigarettes, I'm talking about using a smoker on your bees. And last but not least, at the very end, I'll have a section of miscellaneous stuff that I couldn't figure out anywhere else to put in, but I still thought there were some lessons to learn. So with that, let's go right into saving the bees. And the first question is, does beekeeping really save the bees? And when we come down to it, there's a lot of things going on. So what is happening to the bees? Well, first off, there is a loss of habitat and there's a lot of plant changes going on. You've probably read about this or heard it in the news, et cetera. One of the problems is that there's a lot of agricultural planting and land use, which we now call monoculture, where small family farms are being brought up and big agriculture is just planting thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of acres of the same type of plant. And if the bees live in an area where only corn is planted, well, they're in a food desert, just like we've heard about human food deserts, where there's no place for people to go to a local grocery store, the bees get into a food desert. And that does affect how the bees are able to live in that particular environment. Of course, everyone talks about climate change and we do keep on hearing that it's getting warmer and warmer. And that may mean that plants are coming out sooner than normal. And if the bees haven't adjusted their cycles to the cycles of the plants, well, they might miss some of the nectar that they would normally uh, go after early in the spring because these plants are sometimes uh, coming out earlier. And then of course, we hear about pesticides and the big bad neonicotinoids. And you know, in some cases, pesticides are good, but remember pesticides not only kill bad insects, but they kill good insects like our bees. So we have these pesticides out there and I'm not gonna say if they're good or bad, but the fact of the matter is they can affect the bees. And last but not least, of course, we have bee pests like the varroa mite, and luckily, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about varroa mites tonight, although I will give a couple uh, tidbits here or there. Uh, but, you know, in every presentation most people talk to or go to today, they're always going to be bombarded with mites. And they are a pest and other diseases that come with them that cause problems for the bees. Now, believe it or not, beehives in the U.S. are a lot lower today than they were in the past. And in the 1940s, the peak numbers of bees in the U.S. were here because of the war effort for World War II. They used beeswax for lubrication for bullets, uh, for aircraft, and all type of different weapons that were being used in the war effort. And therefore, we had about 6 million hives in the U.S. Since that time, hives have decreased. And today, there's about 2.7 million hives in the U.S., according to the Bee Informed Partnership information and some of the other groups that are out there. And uh, last year, the year before the 2.7 million hives 
were recorded, we were actually at 2.6. So if the bees are having problems, how is it that we've actually gone up maybe 100,000 hives from year to year over the last couple of years? So maybe we've reached a steady state and maybe the bees aren't declining anymore, but they're definitely not going up to those levels of the World War II era where we were at 6 million hives. Now, one of the reasons we have a lot of hives here in the US is about 1.6 million hives are needed for almond uh, pollination in California. Unfortunately, only about 600,000 hives can be uh, supported by the forage that's in California. So that means about 1 million hives have to be moved every year in order to pollinate that almond crop, which is 95% of the almonds in the world. Now that means that we have to transport those million hives and you only can put about 400 to 480 hives on a flatbed. So there's a lot of trucks moving across the country every year in order to pollinate those almonds. Now there is an effect on the environment because one question is when you move those million hives back away from California, where are you gonna leave them all? And also what do you do with the excess bees? Well, as a beekeeper, if you're buying packages or nukes, well, those excess bees from the almond pollination is probably where you're gonna get the bees for your package or your nuke. So that's important to understand that a lot of bees that are coming into our area are coming off of the almonds on a yearly basis. Now, let's talk about knowing your honey. And everyone knows that bees make honey. When I first started out, my wife and I went to our very first bee club meeting and it was in the fall. So people were talking about their honey harvest. And after about a, a half hour of people talking about all the honey they harvested, my wife stood up and said, why are we talking about honey? I'm here to talk about bees. And they looked at her and said, what? And she goes, I don't even like honey. And they said, oh, well, any honey you produce, we'll be happy to take off your hands. And so that was the first lesson we learned in a beekeeping club was bees are going to be producing this honey that we might actually be able to do something with. And of course, you could give it as gifts, you can use it yourself, and eventually you get to a point if you have enough that you may actually start selling it. So one thing to know about your honey is that everyone hears this story about crystallized honey being found in the tombs of Egypt in the early 1900s. And the story goes that uh, they found this crystallized honey and with all the hieroglyphics and everything else, bees are a big part of the Egyptian culture back 3000 years ago. And somehow they decided they would decrystallize this honey, liquefy it, and they'd give it to somebody to taste. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would have been holding my hand up saying, I'm willing to taste that stuff, but somebody did. And they realized that it was as good as the day it came out of the hive. But every time I try to find a reference for this, I've never been able to find any scientific evidence that they really did find this crystallized honey in the tombs. But still, it's a great story at a farmer market or a craft show to tell people. And one of the things I learned early on is you can tell people what you think you know, and if you do it confidently, they're gonna believe you. But like I said, I can't find any research that shows it really happened. When we go looking at honey, uh, a lot of labels on honey states US grade A honey. But if you look at the back of the bottle, sometimes you'll see that it's a product of India or the Ukraine, Argentina, Brazil, et cetera. And yet right below it says product of, it shows US grade A honey packed in the US. So when you're looking at honey, especially if you ever go to buy at the store or people you know are asking about buying honey, make sure they realize that they need to be buying honey that's made in the US. Now, real honey will always crystallize. And when we first started beekeeping, my wife had always bought honey at all these craft fairs because they were in beautiful bottles and things like that. And they were all crystallized and they were just sitting there. When we learned about honey, we realized that we could decrystallize it and use it. And so we started actually using it. Although, like I said, she doesn't like honey. She's a beekeeper, but I go through enough for both of us. Now, tying on the crystallization will all depend on the sugar concentration the nectar types, the storage method, and where your bees actually collected the flowers from. Now, you can always decrystallize your honey using a water bath or a band heater or a warming cabinet, but you don't want to heat it too high because you want to maintain the beneficial properties. Now, at the mile high altitudes that we see here in both Colorado and uh, in, in the Wyoming on the front range, uh, if you put that honey bottle out in the sun, 
it actually will decrystallize in a few hours on its own, especially in the summertime. But the one thing not to do is put it in the car because in the car it can get to be up to 140, 160, even 180 degrees. And the honey will still be sweet, but it loses a lot of the benefits that the enzymes in the honey uh, can give you. Now, of course, we can't make any medical claims. The FDA frowns on that, but most everyone on this call realizes that honey can be very beneficial. So real honey will crystallize. And that's a great thing to be able to tell the folks that you talk to that, uh, you know, if it crystallizes, don't worry about it. Now, one thing most people don't really know about, and that's comb honey. And this picture here shows a little tiny frame. You can actually get 26 of these frames in a medium super. And that frame actually is brought to, brought to you by Echo Bee Box, uh, by Albert Chubach, who was a speaker just a couple of weeks ago here at Wyoming Bee College. Uh, Albert's a friend. When we first started out, uh, we found out about some of the stuff that he was putting together. And we got all of these little uh, comb honeys. And we make comb honey all the time. Now, interestingly enough, when you take and look at a piece of comb honey, sometimes you'll see it's kind of brownish looking. Sometimes it's white looking. And I just recently found out the meanings or the names for these things. And even though I've been making comb honey for five or six years, I just found out that when the comb looks uh, brownish like it is here, that's called wet comb. That means the bees actually filled the cell up all the way to the top of the cell. And when they capped it, the cap is actually in contact with the honey. And that's why it's called wet comb. And yet if it's white, like the bottom, that's dry comb, meaning the bees didn't fill up the cell all the way. And so that cap stays dry. So that's a little interesting tidbit that I never even knew about, but now you're enlightened. And when you go ahead and look at your honey frames or anything else, you can really impress family, family and friends as you're holding that frame and explain to them that, oh, this is dry comb and this is wet comb. They'll really like that. They'll think you're really smart. You're more than an average Joe or average Jane at that point in time, you're an expert. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other myths and fables that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And, and the first one I wanna talk about is the three inches or three miles. But before we get into that, I have this little tidbit here. This is an average Joe beekeeper hint. And later on in the presentation at the end, I'll tell you how you can actually access these hints and tips that I put out every week on my website. But this uh, hint and tip here was, why start with two hives? Most beekeepers know that uh, you know if you have two hives, you have some way to compare things. Now, with beehives, it's a little different. Uh, if you wear two watches, one on each wrist, you never really know what time it is. But if you have two beehives, you can compare the hives, and usually you can tell that one is stronger than the other. Now, they, by most, they be, may both be weak, but at least, if you know one is stronger than the other, uh, you can actually ascertain some things that are going on with the hive. So I like to tell new beekeepers that if you're starting out, try to get two hives if you can. Now, sometimes your local ordinance will only allow one hive, but if you can have two, it's a great way to have resources uh, from one for the other, et cetera. And so try to start out with two if you can. Now let's go about talking about three inches or three miles on moving a hive. Oh, before we go there, note on the bottom here, a colony of bees inhabits a hive. The hive is the physical structure that the bees live in. Now, I make this mistake all the time. I'll say, my hive died. Well, the wood did not die. The bees or the colony in that hive died. And so even I still make this mistake. And it's one of those things that if I had learned differently, Maybe I wouldn't talk about it that often, but most beekeepers, if their bees die over the winter, say their hive died or they lost their hive. And it's like, I see the hive sitting there. It's still there. You lost the bees. So that's one of those little things that is just a little gotcha. And I'll probably say it three times tonight. I'll, I'll talk about losing my hive and the hive is still there. I just lost the bees. So when you place your hive, you want to look at certain things. And I learned a lot about beekeeping by the hive placement on my very first hives. One of the things you want to do is look at location or area for your hive. You want some place that's flat and level. You want some place that's sunny, maybe some shade. And then you want access from all sides. And this is a rookie mistake that I made and a lot of other people make right off the bat of not having access on all sides. The other thing is you want to try to have your hive facing in a southeast direction. Now, the thing about that is in the wild, 
uh, you know, you can't get a hollow tree that's necessarily has an opening in the southeast direction. So the bees will choose any direction that you put the entrance, but yet if you could put it southeast, that helps the bees warm up in the morning, especially during in the winter. Now, access is important to work your hive. And I try to now allow at least three feet in all directions on all sides of the hives. A lot of people like to build these hive stands where they have three or high, uh, four hives in a row and there's only six inches in between. And I find that very hard to work on an individual hive if I don't have space around each hive. And another thing is I like to allow area behind the hive so that I can put my components while I'm inspecting. Now you see this picture of one of my very first hives in the garden. It looked really nice. My wife was really happy with how cute it looked there. And yet it was right up against the deck and I couldn't get behind the hive. And in fact, when I wanted to get on the other side to inspect, I had to cross the flight line of the bees. And invariably a bee would get caught up in my jacket or my veil. And if I wasn't wearing uh, equipment or, or protective equipment, uh, I would probably get stung because I was in front of the hive. One of the very first things I learned from a real old timer was you never go in front of the hive because you're going to make the bees mad because you're in the flight path. Well, one of the things I learned is that by moving it out three feet, I have space behind the hive that I can put my hive components. The other thing that's really nice is on the hive stands that I build now, I have a little hive rest where I can put four or five frames from inside the hive. So when I'm inspecting, I can place them on that rest and they're out of the way so that I have more room inside the hive. Now, if you don't have a, a cool uh, rest in, in your uh, stand like I have, you can buy one of these little items that's down on the bottom right-hand corner there, a hive rest. That's just a little piece of steel that hangs off the top box and you can put your frames there. Now, when you go into the bottom box and it's sitting there and you have some frames on it, and you forget about removing the frame rest and you put the top box on, it's filled with honey. And all of a sudden you look there and your frame rest is sitting there. Well, you have a choice. You could either take the hive apart, which I have done many a time, or you could just leave it there and buy a new one for the other hives. So it's up to you how you wanna do it. But I've made that mistake many a time, leaving the frame rest on there and forgetting to take it off. So that's one of the things I would I'd remind you. It's great to have the frame rest, but don't leave it on there when you put your hive back together. Now, another thing uh, I talked about putting uh, components behind the hive. What I like to do is I take my outer cover and put it behind the hive after I take it off. Then I put my inner cover on top of that and I kind of stagger it a little bit so that there's some spaces for bees that might be on the, on the bottom uh, of that inner cover and, and now inside of the top cover that's on the ground, uh, they can fall into there. Then as I take my top box off or my super, I put it on there and there again, I stagger it a little bit so that there's very little contact space. So I crush less bees. And then as I go down through each super and into the deeps by staggering them and stacking them on top, any bees that fall off of the frames fall into the top or into the telescoping cover. And especially if my queen falls off, I'm not stepping on her and killing her. Now I have never done that yet, but I have found the queen on the ground running around. And if I hadn't been careful, I would have crushed her. So by putting your boxes on top of the inner cover uh, or, or the outer cover, I should say, uh, you run less risk of killing your queen and nobody really wants to do that. Now, another thing is that when you're deciding what type of boxes to have, understand that two deep or brood boxes really are about the same space as three mediums. A lot of people like to look at having standardization, only having mediums, or even only having deeps. And one of my hints and tips talks about the fact that two deeps are equal to three mediums. I'll let you go and read more about that on my tips and hints site at a later time. Now, this is something that happens occasionally. And I will say that this is not my box. This is a box I inherited from someone. If you look on the left-hand side of the picture there, you can see there's a handhold on the front or the back, whichever that may be. But if you look at the side, you'll note that there's no handhold there. Well, if you look inside the box, there's the handhold. Doesn't work very well on the inside of the box. Uh, if you're assembling your own boxes, you need to remember, make sure the handholds are on the outside before you glue and screw it together. Because if it's like this on the bottom right-hand corner, it's not gonna do you much good 
in lifting up that box. Now, I will admit that I have assembled boxes previously of my own that look exactly like that. So it happens to the best of us. But if you just think about it while you're putting it together, you won't run into that problem. And it makes it a lot easier to lift the box when you have a handhold. Now let's talk a little bit about um, hive placement and orientation so we can get back to that three uh, inch or three mile rule. Uh, and the first thing is remember that forager bees, when they become foragers, actually orient themselves by geolocating their hive location. You know, bees have built-in GPS, believe it or not. Now, they use the sun position and landmarks to locate their home. And the way they do this is they have actually three little light sensors on the top of their head, which are called oscilli or ocelli. And what they do is they can sense the sun because they can sense ultraviolet rays and they have those three different sensors that allows them to triangulate. So it really is like the GPS that we use. They can triangulate to the sun and figure out where they are. And once they know where the sun is, and they also have a way of telling time, uh, they can actually tell where their hive is uh, located. And if you move your hive without making the bees reorient, the bees are gonna return to the initial location of where that hive was. And if there's no hive there anymore, they're just gonna congregate uh, right there and uh, they're not gonna know what to do or where to go. So when you reorient your hive, most people say you gotta move it three miles so that the bees uh, can't find their way home. Now, if you can't move it three miles, folks say place some branches or grass on the landing board and that's gonna cause the bees to reorient. And what I have found in my experience is it's not consistent when you put leaves or branches in front of the hive. And the reason it's not consistent is that the bees have very little eyes and what we can't see through with our big eyes, they can actually see through. So instead, I like to use what we call a view block. And that view block uh, actually is like a brick wall in front and the bees can't see their landmarks when they come out of the hive. And you can use this technique, whether you're moving uh, the hive to a new location and it doesn't have to be two or three miles away. And my view blocks, as you can see in this picture, are just pieces of cardboard that I actually duct tape to the front of the hive. And on a close up here, you can see that uh, that is just about a four inch tall piece of cardboard of 16 inches wide, four inches down each back. And when the bees come out, they get confused because they can't see landmarks. And so they reorient. And I was able to move 20 or 30 hives this year using this method. And all the bees found the new location every time and didn't go back to the old location. So here's kind of a useful tip that if you need to move the hive only a few feet because you forgot to leave that three foot axis behind, just do a little view block like this at night uh, and, and actually lock the bees in with your entrance reducer, put the uh, view block up, and then in the morning, move the hive three feet or three inches or six feet or 15 or wherever you wanna move it. And when you let them out, they will reorient, believe it or not. Now, the two to three mile range is because the normal range of bees is a two and a half mile range. And so people would say that if you go ahead and make, a, you know, moving three miles, it's further than they've ever flown and therefore they're not gonna go back to the old location. Believe it or not, 12,566 square acres are encompassed in that two and a half mile foraging. And you can actually use things like Google Maps to figure out where your hive is and then determine what kind of forage the bees are gonna have. This right here is in the middle of Denver uh, by the Cherry Creek Mall. And you can see that there's a lot of green area. And of course, there are a lot of plants that are planted in gardens and flower boxes so that the bees actually do have a wide range of forage in this urban area. Now, most people know that there's various plants that they can plant and things like thyme, cilantro, sage, fennel, they can all be planted in, in flower boxes or planters. So even if you don't have bees, but you have a patio or a balcony, you can actually plant flowers that are good for the bees. Now, one thing that most people don't consider is that trees can be bee plants. And this chart here shows a bunch of trees that can grow in both Colorado and Wyoming in the weather that we have. And it actually shows the blooming months. The neat thing about planting trees is instead of a plant or a flower that may only have uh, tens or, or hundreds of bl blossoms, when you plant a tree that blossoms, it can have 
hundreds of thousands of blossoms in that one tree. So if anyone ever asks you, what can I plant in my yard to help the bees? Tell them about one of these trees and maybe they'll really give a good smorgasbord to the bees. Well, now that we've talked a little bit about the two mile or three mile rule, let's get back to that disconnecting the wings. Now, by disconnecting the wings, as some people would say, the bees can actually shift their muscles to create heat to keep warm all winter long here in Colorado and Wyoming. Now, it's interesting to look at the wings of the bees, and there's actually four wings, although most people only see two. That's because we have a large forewing and a smaller hind wing. Now, they have these cool things called hamuli or hooks that actually hook the two wings together so that the two wings actually move as one. And this combined adjustable surface provides the lift that allows the bees to fly. Now, believe it or not, bees are capable of flying on average about 15 miles an hour and can actually fly from 12 to 20. But if we go back to that two and a half mile radius that they're normally flying for foraging, most foragers can do about three trips an hour to collect nectar. So if you look at that, multiply by the days, uh, by, by the hours of sunlight in a day and think of how many foragers are in a hive, you can see that they can make a lot of trips to flowers on a daily basis. But, you know, let's get back to the wings and shivering and creating the heat. Well, the bees actually have flight muscles and those flight muscles are actually attached to the thorax and not the wings themselves. So the wings are not actually connected to muscles at all. So the bees don't have to disconnect their wings because the wings were never connected in the first place. They are actually uh, attached to the thorax and the thorax uh, actually distorts to provide movement because it has two sets of muscles, top to bottom and front to back. And so in order to fly, the bees actually uh, distort the uh, torso and that actually makes the wings move and when they're flying, they create a figure eight in order to provide lift. But if they don't wanna move the wings, they can just shiver those muscles and that's what creates the heat to keep the bees warm throughout the winter in the cluster. So when someone asks you, you know, do the bees really disconnect their wings? No, they're not dislocating their shoulders like we might think about with ourselves, but rather they're just shivering muscles that are staying stationary. Now, another big question always comes up is, should I inspect my hive? Doesn't it bother the bees? Isn't it going to cause problems? And I like to think about it this way. Some people say that there are downsides to inspecting the hive, and they always give reasons not to inspect. And one of those is that it sets back the hive or the colony, because when you open up the hive, the bees tend to suck up honey and now it's not stored anymore, but now it's in their honey stomachs. But you know, I've never found any peer reviewed research that would uh, support this. So I don't know if opening up the hive and inspecting really does cause problems or set the bees back because the bees are gonna continue to forage the next day. They're going to continue to put nectar in the cells and everything else. So I don't think it does set a hive back, but I'm just an average Joe and I could be wrong. Now, another thing is that people say that when you open the hive, the bees get a, a, aggressive and defensive. But you know, aggression and defensive are all in the eyes of the beholder. I was called out this summer to someone's hive. They said, these bees are just the most aggressive defensive bees I've ever seen. And so I went over to their house and I approached the hive and they were the calmest bees I'd ever seen. But to that person, they were very aggressive. So it all depends on your point of view and what you've seen previously. And I don't really think it makes the bees aggressive. Now you might have some who get a little more defensive and they might be bouncing off your veil and things like that. But inspecting really uh, should, uh, should be done because uh, just because they might get a little defensive, you need to look at what's going on inside the hive. Now, some people say they're afraid of killing their queen as they're moving the frames out. And my uh, answer to that is, if you use good technique when you're inspecting, you can overcome all of these downsides. So when you're inspecting, what are you looking for? Well, you wanna look for eggs in their positions. You wanna look for larvae of various sizes and color. You wanna look for capped brood, bee bread, capped honey. And of course, if you're a new beekeeper, you might not know what they look like, but after getting into some inspections, especially if you can do an inspection with someone who's seen uh, the inside of a beehive before, 
you can start looking and finding these various things and that will help you in your education as a beekeeper. And you know, if you're lucky, sometimes you'll actually see a bee doing a waggle dance. And at first you won't know what's going on, but remember that there is this little dance they do and they waggle around and they do some figure eights on the surface of the comb. And when you get to see one of those, it's amazing what mother nature can do. And then of course, you wanna look for pollen on the corbicula. That's another cool bee word, corbicula. Uh, and, and that is actually what we call the pollen basket on the rear leg. And in the bottom photo here, you can see that orange pollen on the pollen basket. And when you see that, it also tells you that maybe, just maybe the queen is laying eggs because when the queen is laying eggs, the bees need to be bringing in pollen in order to feed uh, protein to those larvae so that they can develop properly. And then of course, sometimes you wanna look for tropolaxis, which is a cool Greek word, which means nothing more than transferring fluids. And sometimes you can see a bee's tongue or proboscis out and another bee is kind of licking it with their proboscis. What they're actually doing is transferring fluid in most cases, but sometimes they're actually exchanging pheromones or hormones that are used to help communication in the hive. Of course, you want to look for workers and drones and know the difference of the size so that you can identify each. And of course, if you're lucky, you get to see the queen. I don't know if some of you have seen, I think it's a State Farm commercial where there's a beekeeper out there and talking to the insurance agent. And he says, do you wanna see the queen? And the insurance agent says, no, I'm not dressed properly to meet the queen. But anyway, it's, it's a nice little aside uh, to see some beekeeping on TV every once in a while, if you watch some network TV. Now, all these things you don't get to see unless you're doing inspections. And when you do inspections, you can really appreciate mother nature at her finest inside of the beehive. So I definitely uh, recommend that you do uh, inspections whenever you can. Now, another thing that inspections can do, especially if you're a new beekeeper or you're starting up a new hive uh, with a new colony, uh, sometimes you need to make decisions on when you need to add additional frames or boxes. And on this picture here, you can see uh, on that oval there that the bees are just starting to build some wax on this plastic frame that is completely empty. Well, when you're first starting out a hive, especially a Langstroth hive, uh, once you have comb completely covering seven to eight frames of the 10 in a 10 frame box, then it's time to add your second deep box and let the bees continue to build wax there. And of course, once they've built out that second deep box, then you can actually add a super and get them to start building uh, comb there. So if you have brand new frames, brand new foundation, uh, you want to use your inspection to determine when you need to put new equipment on the hive itself. And believe it or not, with a good nectar flow, or if you're feeding uh, sugar syrup, you can actually have 10 frames built out in a week or less. And there again, if you're not inspecting on a weekly basis, you're going to miss out on some of these milestones that uh, you wouldn't see if you're only inspecting every two or three weeks. Now, another thing when you're in your hive, you wanna observe the number of bees and you can count frames of bees or in a lot of cases, you can just look at the top of the frames. And if the bees are all over all the frames on the top, you can usually make some good estimates about how many bees are there. A lot of people like to call bees jam packed like this on a frame boiling over with bees. And of course, one of the reasons we say it's boiling over <coughs> is because they're on top of the frames. So there's not enough room on the frame itself so they're boiling over to the top. Now, believe it or not, a fully covered deep frame has about 1,500 bees on each side or about 3,000 on each frame. So today I was out in some of my hives because it was 55, 60 degrees. And in one of the hives, I had four frames that were half filled uh, with bees on each side. So that really meant that I had about two frames fully filled with bees which means I only have about 6,000 bees in that hive right now. Hopefully that'll be enough to create heat over the next few weeks and months to continue to maintain that cluster and that hive will survive. Of course, I had a couple other hives that had six and seven frames fully filled with bees. So they really had a lot of bees to make a cluster. Now, sometimes when you're inspecting, people say you can do a mite inspection. And some people like to say, they didn't see any mites when they were in on their inspection. And really trying to do a visual inspection of mites is not recommended. Why do you say that? Well, can you really see a phoretic mite? If you, if you believe a lot of the research, 
most of the time mites are on the underside of the bee. And many beekeepers can't even find their queen, which is double the size of a bee. So how are you gonna find something the size of a sesame seed on the back of a bee when most of the time they're on the underside of the bee? So if you can't find your queen, how are you gonna find a mite? Well, if you see mites like this picture here, you probably need to do something and do something quick because that particular colony is overrun with mites. Now, what else can you do with your inspections? Well, you can determine if you need to do a split. Now, if you do an inspection, you find that there's brood on six to eight frames within your hive, uh, and you look at the brood itself, and you can assess how much area that is covered by brood. Like in this picture here, you can see the brood is not covered by the bees there, but more than likely the brood is under those bees also. And there's about 3,500 cells per each side of a frame, which means there's about 7,000 potential cells on any one frame. And if you only look at 80% coverage, that means there's about 5,700 bees that are gonna be on that frame. And if you have six to eight frames, that means 34,000 to 47,000 new bees within the next 21 days. That hive is going to be overflowing with bees very quickly if you have six to eight frames. If you have six to eight frames of brood, you might want to consider splitting that hive because otherwise they're probably going to swarm. Now, some other inspection observations that you might do, you might see queen cups or emergency cells and a lot of new beekeepers panic, but these are just in case cells. The bees like to do this when they have nothing else to do. They'll build these little marble shaped queen cups or emergency cells as a just in case, kind of to make sure they know how to build a queen cell. Now, sometimes you'll see a cell like this bottom right-hand corner there, and you can look inside the cell and you can see that white royal jelly. And if you see white royal jelly inside of the cell, as opposed to the emergency cup that doesn't have any royal jelly in it, uh, you may need to come back and look at that pretty soon because depending on where that cell is located, it could be meaning that the bees are preparing to swarm or it could just be that the bees are gonna replace the queen with a soup procedure. In either case, if you see cells with royal jelly, you really need to make sure you're going in within another week or so and plan uh, an inspection so that you can track the growth and possible emergence of a queen from that particular uh, hive. Now, a lot of people talk about smoke, using the smoke or not using smoke. And depending on the time of the year, the nectar flow, the weather, the number of bees, you may wanna use smoke. I always say that light your smoker just in case, better to have it available and not need it than having a need for it and not having it available. Now, some people say that the smoker actually makes the bees think that there's a forest fire and they're going to have to leave their cavity in the tree if the forest fire gets too near. So they take and eat up some honey and get ready to leave the hive, abscond in fact, and find a new home. Now, other people say that uh, that's not really the case. That's a fable, that's a myth. Uh, some people say that the smoke just blocks pheromones from being communicated between the bees. And so when you open up the hive uh, and the defense pheromone goes up as an alarm, by having the smoke, you're blocking the pathways for the bees to smell those alarm pheromones. And that's why they are a little calmer. Whichever the case may be, myth or fable, uh, as I said, I like to have the smoker just in case, but I prefer not to use it if I don't need it. Um, before I go on, I see that there is a question here. What does the location of the queen cup tell you? And so let's go back to that and we'll talk about the smokers in just a minute. Normally what happens is if the bees are superseding, they will build the queen cell on the center of a frame. But you gotta be aware that sometimes the bees don't uh, make comb all the way to the bottom of the frame. So if you're using a plastic uh, foundation and the, the, the wax only goes down halfway to the bees where the wax ends is the bottom of the frame. Now, normally if they're creating swarm cells, those swarm cells will be on the bottom of the frame. And that tells you that they may be ready to swarm. So you got to be careful about placement because if the comb ends at the middle of the frame, then that really could be a swarm cell as opposed to a supersedure cell. 
So Diana, hopefully that answers your question about where the queen cup is located and, and what it tells you. So back to smoke. I Like I said, I like to light a smoker just in case. Don't like to use it if I don't have to. And some people says that smoke sets the hive back because the bees are taking honey out of the comb. So let's look at some other methods that you could use if you don't wanna use smoke. Some people like to mist the bees with sugar water and they say it calms the bees down because it distracts the bees. How does it distract the bees? Well, the bees start licking the honey, uh, the, the, the sugar syrup off the other bees. And if they're licking the honey off the bees, they're not gonna be paying attention to you. So if you don't wanna smoke the bees, you might try using sugar water as a mist. Another uh, option is using liquid smoke. If you go onto the barbecue aisle in the condiment section of most grocery stores, you'll find various manufacturers of liquid smoke. And what you can do with this liquid smoke is take about one ounce of liquid smoke, add it to a quart of water, put it in a spray bottle and provide that as a smoky mist. And there again, it kind of smells like the smoke. When I'm spraying that, I can smell the smoke. So if the smoke is actually keeping the bees from smelling uh, the alarm pheromone, well then sometimes the liquid smoke will help instead of having to use uh, the regular smoke. And of course, when we have drought in, in Colorado and Wyoming and we're not allowed to have open fires and smokers running, uh, maybe the liquid smoke is a better way to do it. And I have successfully used liquid smoke many a time. So try it out, you might like it. Now, on this next si uh, slide, I wanna talk about a really interesting product. And I'm actually even gonna talk about the name of this product and I'm not gonna block out the name and stuff like that. It's that sometimes you just come across a product that everyone should know about. And in my mind, crud cutter is it. And crud cutter looks like this. You can find it uh, on websites, in catalogs. I originally found it in one of the big uh, B catalogs and I decided to try it out. It didn't really say what it's for, but what I found out is it essentially melts propolis, wax, and honey on contact. When I see, when I have a piece of propolis like on a white, uh, uh, white bee suit, if I take and spray some crud cutter on it, you can actually see the propolis melting, and it actually is liquefying and running on the white. And in fact, yesterday was in I was in my hives, and I didn't realize I didn't zip up my jacket all the way, and I was carrying a bunch of um, uh, boxes with, uh, you know, frames in them and stuff. And there was propolis on the end. And when I got home at night, my good uh, black sweater that I was wearing under my bee suit had all kind of propolis right around my stomach. Now, I don't know because my stomach's too big now, or if it's just the way I was carrying things. But the bottom line is, I thought my sweater was ruined. And so I sprayed it with propolis, with, with the crud cutter, and I let it sit overnight. And this morning, I went back and I sprayed it with more crud cutter, threw it in the washing machine when it came out, no propolis whatsoever. So this is a product that if you haven't tried, you know, you might want to find it. You, you can find it at home improvement stores. You can find it at um, uh, places like uh, the Big W uh, or even some of the grocery stores in, in the products for, for cleaning. And, uh, you know, it's worth trying out, especially if you got a lot of propolis. And I do have a disclaimer here. I use it. It works for me. I don't represent the manufacturer or the distributors. They're not paying me for this, endorsing this product. But you know, if they find out I'm endorsing it and they want to start sending me endorsement money, I'll gladly take the dollars. But you know, if you're interested in removing propolis, check this out. An average Joe uh, recommends it highly. Well, with that, um, I mentioned before some of the tips and hints and talking about smokers. And here again, we're not going to go into these tips and hints. You can go off and read them on your own, but a metal pail for transporting your smoker inside the car can really save your, uh, your, yourself and, and not start a fire or smoky uh, situation while you're inside the car. So read that tip and hint about getting a metal pail for smokers. And the other thing is sometimes it's hard to light your smoker and you can actually buy a propane torch with a little click starter as shown on the right hand uh, bottom picture here. And all you gotta do is just click on that little red uh, igniter and the propane torch right, uh, lights right up. You don't have to deal with matches and burning your fingers. And uh, it's really a nice way to start your smoker. So if you're gonna do some smoking of bees, you might wanna consider getting one of these little uh, devices from some of the big box home improvement stores and uh, it'll make lighting your smoker so much easier. So now let's go on to this interesting subject 
of fainting queens. And you know, before we talk about the fainting queens, another one of my tips and hints is if you bought a nuke and you still have that nuke box, take that nuke box out to your uh, hive when you're gonna do an inspection. And as you're pulling frames out, if you don't have one of those cool frame rests like I talked about before, you can always put a frame inside the nuke box. Now, if you find the queen and the frame she's on, if you put that queen and the frame in the nuke box, you know you're not gonna roll the queen. And you know, if you do a mic test or a mic count, you know that you're not gonna have her inside that shaker jar or in the alcohol where you might kill her. So if you have a nuke box sitting around, you might utilize it to segregate the queen. Now let's talk about the fainting queens. And when you're doing your inspection and you see the queen, as I said, segregate her. And if she's segregated, you can actually consider marking her. One of the nice things about a marked queen, and for years, I never wanted to mark queens, one, because I was afraid I was gonna kill them, but two, because one of the things I saw was that, you know, what benefit does it do for me? When you buy a marked queen, sometimes you have to pay three to $5 extra. And, you know, I'm kind of stingy with money, so I don't want to spend three or $5 extra just for a dot of paint on the back of my queen. But one thing is when the queen is marked, if your colony swarms and you go in on your inspection and you find a queen that's not marked, then you definitely know that that colony has swarmed. A lot of times when they swarm, it will still look like you had the same amount of bees before the swarm occurred. But if the queen was marked and you no longer have a marked queen, then you know that she swarmed. Of course, the other thing, uh, when you're trying to mark the queen, and they have these little queen uh, kit marking kits that have a little foam piston so that you can kind of get the queen between the, the lines there and mark her, um, you can actually cause the queen to faint. So if you're taking too much time to get her in the case, um, she will actually actually faint. And I read about this research this summer and I had never heard about fainting queens until we were trying to mark one of our queens and all of a sudden she stopped moving. And there she is on my glove. And my wife was just besides herself saying, how did we kill the queen? So we put her down on top of the frame and we started talking about where are we gonna find a queen to replace the queen in this particular hive. And, and you know, when I read about fainting queens before, I was skeptical. But as we're talking, all of a sudden, she woke up for her, from her fainting and she ran down back into the hive because she had been on top of the frames. So the bottom line is the bees, there are such things as fainting queens. And if you look it up on some of the scientific research, you will find that it's a real thing. And I was skeptical and I'm skeptical about a lot of stuff but this one was true. When I said it to my wife, she said, you're just saying that to make me feel better. And it wasn't because I had actually read about it in my research. So, you know, believe it or not, there are fainting queens. Now, you know, if you were in there looking for your queen and you did something like you rolled her or killed her, or in this case, if I had actually killed her, there are various ways to replace your queen. And one way, of course, is by purchasing queens. They come in a little queen cage like this. If you've ever bought a package, you see them like that. And there are some advantages and disadvantages. And first I wanna talk about the cons or the disadvantages of buying a queen. And one is that sometimes it's too early in the season to get a queen, you can't get them from anywhere. And if you need a queen and you can't buy one, well, you've got a problem. Of course, uh, here in Colorado and Wyoming, sometime uh, it's just too cold for the bees to be shipped here. So you might not be able to get a queen. Of course, you know, who wants a foreign queen from Florida or Texas or California? We want good old front range queens. And, you know, we don't want these foreign queens coming in here and messing up our genetics. So, you know, that could be a disadvantage if that's the way you think. Sometimes the colony won't even accept that queen. And so if they don't accept her, what are you going to do? And oh, by the way, sometimes you got to pay $30, $50 for the queen. And sometimes you got to pay as much uh, to ship the queen as you did for the queen itself. So it could be up to $100 to get a queen in. Of course, there are advantages to queen replacements. One is that she's a proven mated queen. She's ready to lay as soon as she's released. And uh, you have less of a time when you have a brood break if you buy a queen. But you know, another way of replacing your queen is by raising your own queen. Now, there are some really in intricate methods of pulling out larvae and using these little tools and all this other stuff. But I like to raise my queens by letting the bees do it themselves. And all I do is move a brood frame 
from one good hive to a hive that needs to queen. And if I have eggs or larvae that are two to four days old, uh, and I put that frame into a hive that doesn't have a queen in it at that point in time, the bees will be able after a few hours to understand that there is not a queen in there. And they'll actually start making queens out of these uh, larvae, or if there's not larvae at the right age, they'll wait till those eggs uh, hatch. And then when they're the right age, they'll actually make them into queens. Now there's some disadvantages to this too, because it takes a longer brood break to get the queen uh, up and running and actually producing. And so the queen has to be capped. She has to metamorphosize. She has to mature. She has to get mated and then start the reproduction cycle. So it could take six to seven weeks before you're up to production again by raising your own queen by moving a brood frame. But if you do that, you know that you're using locally adapted bees because these bees are bees that have been in Colorado for a while. And that makes you a little more sustainable being able to take things on on your own. Now, when you create your own queens like that, sometimes it doesn't work out and you get a laying worker. Now, if you lose your queen and don't requeen in a certain amount of time, and it all varies by location, time of year, and things like that, you can have what we call a laying worker. And sometimes uh, the virgin queen that you produced doesn't have a successful mating and that could turn into a laying worker situation. Sometimes it's too early in the year for her to mate, and so you become queenless. Sometimes there aren't drones available because it's too early in the spring. Uh, sometimes the queen can be lost when she goes out on her mating flight. Well, how does she get lost? Well, there are predators out there. Birds and things like dragonflies eat bees, and so if she's out on a mating flight coming back to the hive and gets picked off by a predator, well, all of a sudden you're queenless again. And of course, sometimes the queen might not be able to find her way home. So all these things could result in a laying worker situation. And when you have a laying worker situation, a lot of times you'll see multiple eggs in the cells and the eggs will actually be, be misplaced. In other words, they'll be on the side of the cell instead of the center. Now, sometimes you have a laying worker and it looks like there's only one egg in every cell. But what can happen there is when the bees, the worker bees, the nurse bees, find that there's multiple eggs, they'll start cleaning it up. So depending on when you do your inspection and when the laying workers are laying, you might only see one egg in every cell. But the, the point there is, if it's not in the center, if it's on the wall, if it's in this case, as you can see in some of the pictures there, a larvae and an egg in the same cell, more than likely you have a laying worker. Now, here's one of those myths or one of those fables that if you have a laying worker, there are several different remedies. And one that everyone always mentions is shake out the bees about 50 to 100 feet or more away from the hive. And what's gonna happen is the nurse bees have never flown. They've never oriented to the hive and therefore they're not gonna go back to the hive. So essentially you're dumping the laying workers out on the ground. Now I have found that it doesn't work well for me when I've tried it. In this case, I actually put some boards down about 100 feet away from my hive, dumped all the bees out on those boards and within an hour, there were no bees on the boards anymore. And within an hour, I went back to my hive and that hive seemed to be filled with bees. So it didn't work for me. You can try it uh, if you have a laying worker, try uh, you know, shaking out the bees. But in practice, I haven't found that it works. Now, what I do find works is I add a frame of brood from a, another hive into the hive that I believe has laying workers. And the science or theory behind this is that the brood puts out pheromones that actually suppress the laying workers' um, ovaries. Now, when a queen is in there, the pheromone the queen gives off is gonna suppress the other uh, workers' ovaries so they can't produce eggs. Now, of course, if a laying worker is out there, she's only gonna uh, lay drone eggs because she has no sperm to fertilize those eggs. So by putting brood pheromone back into the hive, by adding a frame of brood, it starts to take and suppress the laying workers. Now, you do that the first week and then repeat a week later. And then one week after that second brood addition, I requeen with a slow release of five to six day release so that the, uh, the um, bees get used to that queen. And usually that fixes my laying worker uh, problem. Now, of course, another way you could do this is just combine that laying worker uh, colony with a, vi a viable uh, strong colony with the paper 
uh, combine method. And usually that will stop the laying workers and actually make a strong hive even stronger with more bees. Now let's quickly talk about feeding. And there's many different ways to feed bees. And why do we feed? Well, one of the reasons is that believe it or not, it takes 11 milligrams of sugar per bee per day just for normal survival. Now, 11 milligrams of sugar doesn't sound like much, but when you got 40,000 bees in a colony, that's about seven pounds of dry sugar in order to make up the syrup to keep those bees just functioning and alive. And then if you have brood frames and you have uncapped brood or larvae, it's gonna take another two and a half pounds of sugar to feed each frame of uncapped brood. And if you have six or eight frames of uncapped brood, that's a lot of sugar that the bees need and they have to bring it in normally through nectar. And if it's early in the spring and there's no nectar out there, how are they gonna get that sugar? Oh, by the way, if you're building wax on foundation because you have blank frames, it takes anywhere from six to 10 pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So what that means is with about a third of a pound to a half a pound of wax on every deep frame, you're gonna need a lot of pounds of honey or sugar water to get those bees to build up the wax. So there's all kinds of different feeding methods. And hopefully you know about baggy feedings, you know about Boardman feeders on the front, Boardman feeders on the top, pail feeders, even uh, frame feeders or, or top feeders. All those methods are good and they're all appropriate at different times of the years, depending on what you're uh, trying to accomplish. We're not gonna go into that today, but just know that you can feed, feed and feed some more so that you can help the bees do what they're normally trying to do. Now, the question always comes up, how do you make up sugar syrup? What are the correct ratios? Well, the chemical properties, both density and specific gravity of sugar and water can be combined together so that you can either do sugar syrup uh, mixing by volume or by weight. So if you do one cup of sugar with one cup of water, you have a one-to-one -one sugar syrup. And likewise, if you take one pound of sugar with one pound of water, you still have a one-to-one -one ratio. And if you want a different ratio, you can double the sugar to water, either by pounds or by cups, and have a two-to-one concentration. Now, continuing on with this mode of thinking, since water weighs about eight pounds per gallon, you can actually use volume and weight for your mixture if you make sure you keep things straight. So if you add eight pounds of sugar to one gallon of water, you're gonna have a one-to-one -one concentration. Now, the thing that I learned the hard way is if you take a one gallon bucket and you put one gallon of water in there and start adding eight pounds of sugar, all of a sudden things are gonna overflow because that sugar is a concentrated solution and the sugar actually takes up space along with the water and so if you're gonna to try to mix up one gallon of water with eight pounds of sugar, get at least a one and a half gallon container. Otherwise, you're gonna be overflowing sugar syrup all over the kitchen table or wherever you're mixing up your sugar. Now, good nutrition means healthy bees. And you can use one-to-one -one sugar plus pollen patties to, sim to stimulate your brood rearing. And you can do this either in the spring or the fall. Of course, in the spring, if you're feeding sugar water right now, one-to-one, -one, plus some pollen patties, you're gonna kickstart the brood buildup and that queen is gonna start laying eggs. In the fall, if you wanna build up winter bees for your cluster, you can also feed one-to-one -one sugar syrup with pollen and the bees are gonna build up more bees uh, for the winter. Now, sugar syrup can also be used to build up your food stores in the fall. And when you do that, you want to use that two-to-one concentration. Now, people always say, should I use cane sugar or beet sugar? And you know what? The bees don't care. It doesn't matter. From a chemical properties, sugar cane sugar and beet sugar are essentially the exact same uh, makeup and the bees will take either. So you don't have to only buy cane sugar. Uh, if beet sugar is cheaper, like I said, I'm kind of frugal. Uh, I'll buy whichever sugar type I can get uh, at the most inexpensive rate. Now, if you are making up sugar water or syrup, you might want to consider adding vitamins and supplements because natural nectar has various minerals. Recently, uh, I just read something about iron levels in nectar 
And uh, if the iron level is low, much like people, uh, the bees get a little lethargic and can't uh, work up to their potential. So if you have a way of adding some vitamins uh, using supplements such as Honey Bee Healthy, Hive Alive, or some of these other supplements that are out there, it might be a good idea to add those so that instead of just straight sugar, you're actually getting some vitamins and minerals. Now, you've made it through winter. You know, a lot of people are starting to check their hives right now. Well, what's next? Well, what's next right now is pollen. And here in the Denver area, around the 9th or 10th of February, we usually start seeing uh, pollen coming off of the silver maples. And if pollen is coming out, then the bees are happy because it's time to start making new baby bees. Now, everyone knows that bees use what we call bee bread as their pollen stores. And you can see in this picture here, some of the various colored pollen that's stored in this particular frame. Well, coming out of winter, bees need pollen in order to start re uh, rearing their brood for the spring buildup. And you know, until natural sources like the silver maples available, sometimes uh, you, they need to fall back on the stores they have. On a deep frame, there's about 130 square inches <coughs> per side. And so when you go into winter, if you have two to three frames of bee bread, you're gonna have enough for the bees to start brew rearing in the spring. Now, you can feed solids. And here again, there's an average Joe Hinton tip <coughs> that talks about winter patties and spring patties. And there is a difference. So you wanna read that when you get a chance. But you can do external feeding of solids, <coughs> excuse me, and that's known as pollen substitute. And spring pollen is gonna feed colony growth. And you can see on this picture here where I'm feeding some pollen substitute that the bees are just going after it. And today when I was out looking at hives on every one of the apiaries where we had these uh, pollen substitutes out there, the bees were just swarming it. They were going after it. They know it's time to start the spring buildup and they're trying to bring in those items so that they can build up for the spring. Now, I told you at the beginning, I was gonna talk about these different fables or myths. Well, there's other miscellaneous thoughts here. So we're gonna cover some of these other miscellaneous myths that come about and things I've learned. And one of those is contradictory signs of life. You may go out and if there's snow there, you're gonna see all kinds of dead bees in front of your hive. And if you're a newer beekeeper, you're gonna be going, oh my gosh, this is terrible. My bees are dead. And even in this picture here, you can see all these bees on the deck in front of those hives. And it's like, what did I do wrong? Well, believe it or not, when you look in those hives with the bees out front, they're boiling over in a lot of cases, which means the reason the bees are out front is the worker bees or the undertaker bees are doing their job. In other words, if you have a lot of bees out front, there had to be bees inside the hive to throw them out. And so a lot of times you'll find that there's just bees boiling over inside your hive as indicated by the bees out front. So if you see bees out front of your hive that are dead, uh, maybe it's a good sign in fact, because there's still bees alive to throw the bees out. Now, another sign of life that you'll see, especially after a snowstorm like we're supposed to have in Denver tonight, I don't know if it's gonna snow up in Wyoming or not, but they're saying three to six inches where I'm at. And uh, tomorrow it'll be cold, but a few days later, it's gonna be in the 50s and the bees are gonna be out again. And when the bees are out uh, in the snow like this, you may see these brown dots. And those brown dots mean that the bees are out doing cleansing flights. They're actually uh, defecating into the snow. So when you go out to your apiary and you see these brown dots in the snow, that's a good sign because you know your bees are alive because they're out doing their cleansing flights. Let's talk a little bit about swarms. There's an old beekeeper's adage that goes, a swarm in May is worth a bale of hay. Now I was you know, looking for bales this winter to make wind blocks and some of the bales of hay were running 20 and $30. So back in the old days, they're saying that you know a swarm was worth $30. And then a swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. And with silver being about $30 an ounce, uh, you know that silver spoon, might be worth 30, 40, even $50, depending on how much silver was in it. But they also say that a swarm in July isn't worth a fly. And this is where I deviate from the old timers because I'll take a swarm anytime I can get a swarm because wherever I have a weak hive, I'll combine that swarm into the weak hive 
and I'm going to have a stronger hive. And oh, by the way, I'm going to get a queen usually out of that swarm also. So I might be able to uh, sell that extra queen. Or if I need a queen for a split or I'm not, I have a queen that's not performing, well, now I've got a replacement without having to go and buy a queen. And oh, by the way, that queen out of the swarm is probably an overwintered queen. So there again, I may be more sustainable by having that queen. <clears throat> now, I see a couple other questions here. So before I go on with swarms, I'm gonna answer a couple of these. And, and one person was asking, where can you find pollen patties? And pollen patties uh, can be found in most of the big um, online stores, but also most of the stores uh, in the beekeeping, uh, at least in the Denver area, you usually have pollen patties. Now there are spring patties and winter patties. And around this time of the year, you wanna be looking for spring patties because they have a higher protein percentage and that's better for the bees to start making brood. Uh, the other question is when do uh, I take my mouse guards off? And as we're coming out of winter, uh, it all depends because I don't use mouse guards at all in my hives and I've never had a mouse inside of any of my hives. Now, a lot of the bottom boards that are out there are made with three eighths inch openings. And with a three eighths inch opening, usually a mouse can't get in. But if you have a three quarter inch opening, the mice can get in. Usually the size of a dime, the height of a dime is where a mouse will be able to get in. If it's smaller than that, usually it won't happen. Now, I don't use mouse guards, so I can't recommend when to take them out, but maybe later on, uh, someone can uh, either put in the uh, chat when they take their mouse guards off, or uh, maybe as we get into discussion and questions and answer later on, some folks online here uh, may have some ideas on that, but I really can't answer it because I don't use mouse guards. So I'm not sure if I missed any others, but I'm gonna go on with swarms. So uh, one of the things about swarms is, you know, you gotta look at temperature-based activities. And, you know, if, if you're gonna swarm, uh, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a virgin queen. And if it's not warm enough, the queens can't fly to mate. And according to this temperature-based activity chart I found on the internet, a queen doesn't fly till 68 degrees and drones don't fly to 61. And you know what? If you look down further at 42 to be degrees, bees can't move because their muscles aren't hot enough. And so therefore, you know, if it's 40 degrees, you don't have to worry about the bees flying. Well, um, these areas of 68 and 61 degrees are great if you're on the East Coast or the West Coast or wherever. But what I find here in Colorado and Wyoming, because of the altitude, because of the intense temperature of the sunlight, uh, a lot of times bees will be flying 10, 15 degrees below what this temperature chart says. So, you know, the day that I went out to move a hive and I didn't put my protective equipment on and it was 40 degrees, I said to myself, well, the bees can't fly, it's only 40 degrees, so no worries. And I started moving the hive and I had a little mishap putting the um, entrance reducer in to, to seal them off. And the bees came streaming out after me without the protective gear on. So what that tells me is the bees don't always read the books. So you got to understand that just because the temperature chart says the bees aren't going to do something, the bees are going to do what the bees are going to do. So uh, take that into consideration when you're doing anything with the bees. And that rolls into swarms in just a minute as I'll talk on the next slide. The big thing here is a lot of times people will use a split of their hive or their colony as swarm suppression. And a lot of times people say that splits actually curb the swarm or the urge to swarm. Now, one of the numbers I hear time and time again is no matter what you do, 20% of colonies are gonna swarm even if you've done things like splits and, and, and other uh, activities to suppress that swarm urge. And I will tell you that last year, one of my uh, colonies that I split uh, actually swarmed a week after the split. Luckily it swarmed to a bush right in the apiary. I was able to find that because I happened to be there at the time. I was able to actually rescue that swarm, recover it, and I didn't lose those bees, but it did make a second split, so to speak, out of the one colony. So that one colony became three, but they were all pretty weak because none of them were big enough to really undertake what I wanted them to do. Now, when you make a split, if you move the queen with the split, um, sometimes that better suppresses that swarming urge. And 
even depending on the queen cell maturity in that side of the swarm that's going to happen uh, after swarms may still occur. So even if you try to do a split, even if you try to create your own queen, sometimes those bees are going to swarm no matter what you do. And some people will call splits artificial swarms, but actually when they swarm, there are physiological changes that are triggered by the swarm prep. And uh, the bees actually will put the queen on a diet and they'll actually make her do some physical education by chasing her around the hive to actually make her lose a little weight and stop laying eggs. And so that way uh, they actually have physiological changes. Now, one thing I learned recently about swarms is that the bees will not swarm uh, the, a fly off of the place where they've swarmed to until they have their muscles up to 95 degrees. And I use one of these little infrared thermometers when I see a swarm and I actually take the temperature of the swarm surface. And I have found that when it's at 85 degrees, I probably have a lot of time. And of course, the one time I did this and I measured the temperature of the outside of the swarm, it was only 85 degrees. I took my sweet time getting all my materials together and I turned around and there the bees were flying. So they didn't wait till 95 degrees. It was only 85 degrees and they still went ahead and swarmed. So there again, the bees will do what the bees want to do. And for swarm season, about the last week in April to around the middle of July is when we normally find swarming urge going on. And that's usually associated with the main flow and also the most amount of bees in your particular colony in the hive at that point in time. So uh, when you do uh, get into this time frame, you need to be thinking about how you're going to suppress the swarms. And one way, of course, is doing a split. Now, one thing that many people say is if you add more space in the hive, the bees aren't going to swarm. But that is kind of a misnomer because people will say, I added a honey super above my queen excluder and the bees still swarm. Well, when you do that, you're not adding space for the queen to lay. You're just adding space for honey to be stored. And the whole reason behind swarming is you've got too many bees in the colony. It's getting congested and the bees want to leave so that they have more room for the future. So if you're going to try to suppress swarming by adding space, you need to add space for the queen to lay in. And that might be a third deep or maybe a medium for brood, but do not think that adding a super actually adds space for the queen to lay. One thing about stings I wanna talk about here tonight, and that is uh, everyone knows that you're gonna get stung no matter what, even if you have protective gear. And of course, we all know hopefully that the stinger stays in the skin and the poison sac stays with it as shown in the middle uh, picture there, and it continues to put venom into uh, the victim. But believe it or not, bee sting poison is acidic, whereas wasps have an alkaline poison. And if you've ever gotten stung by a wasp, you'll find that the alkaline in the poison makes it hurt much more than a bee sting. But the reason is that if we have bee poison in our body, which is acidic, there are a lot of bases that can overcome that acidic uh, poison and it doesn't hurt as much. But in our bodies, when we have an alkaline poison from the wasps, we don't have acids that we can make in our body to overcome that alkaline. And that's why we find out that when we're stung by a wasp, it usually hurts a lot more. And of course, when you do get stung, there are alarm pheromones that are coming out of that poison sac. And that's why bees will zero in on where you've been stung and you might get stung a couple times after that. Now, I did mention mites just uh, for a short period of time, but I wanna mention just one more thing, and that is mite population growth, uh, it can be exponential. And when we have mites growing, the time that we normally see the maximum growth is in September. So if you're not treating for mites in June, July, August, or at least monitoring for your mites to determine if you need to treat, this is when, you can cause big problems for your colony. And if you go into winter with 35 mites per 100 bees or some of these astronomical numbers, that colony, no matter how strong it is, probably will not make it through winter because it's gonna weaken the bees. So remember, times of year are very important. And in this area, 
around September is when we would have our maximum mites. So you wanna make sure you're doing something to keep the mites down prior to that August, September timeframe. If you've never seen this book, Tools for Varroa Management, I would tell you to go get it. It's in the uh, PDF uh, form and the link is on this page. And by the way, um, afterwards, if you wanna send me an email, I will send you the PDF of all these files so that you can refer back to the pages. My email will be on uh, some of the uh, slides coming up here and feel free to send me an email. I will go ahead and send you a PDF of these uh, files so that especially you can get stuff like this PDF file. But uh, there's a, a book called Tools for Varroa Management and it's a great guide to how to monitor and control mites. But the Honey Bee Health Coalition also has other resources on forage and nutrition and hive management. Highly recommend getting those items. So we're at the end of the presentation here. And for more information, uh, you can go to my website, happybusybees.com. And what you'll find out there is those weekly tips and hints that I've been talking about. And uh, here's one of the latest ones that was just posted a week or two ago. And uh, you can also look at my beekeeper blog. Every once in a while, I'll post a paper or an article that I've written on my website so that if you don't happen to subscribe to the uh, place that's publishing my articles, uh, you can get them off my website. Now, I also have a Facebook page, The Average Joe Beekeeper. And as I said, I'm an average Joe Beekeeper. I'm not a dummy or an idiot, although those books have some good stuff, but most people can relate to an average Joe. So you can go out to the Facebook page. If you follow it or like it, uh, and you know, um, especially if you found what I was talking about tonight good, well, go ahead and follow and like it, and then you'll get other notifications when I'm doing other seminars and presentations. Of course, share it with your friends and bee groups if you like what I have to say. I also have a Twitter account, not many followers yet, but maybe that'll change in the future. And on both my Facebook and Twitter account, there's reminders that I've posted a weekly hint and tip. There's announcements on various classes and seminars and other events going on in the area, and also other info as appropriate. Um, another place to look if you haven't ever looked there is the American Beekeeping Federation or ABF. Their website is abfnet.org and they have a quarterly magazine, they have a monthly um, email uh, newsletter, and they also have all kinds of different education that is really great. Uh, if you haven't ever heard of them, uh, check it out. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of events, especially once the pandemic restrictions are eased. There's going to be local uh, club meetings, state meetings. Hopefully next year we'll be back in person for the Wyoming Beef College. There's also the South Dakota Buzz in the Black Hills. ABF has an annual conference. This year it's in January in Las Vegas. By then, hopefully enough people are vaccinated that we can go and meet everyone in person in Las Vegas. It'll be a lot of fun. And then of course, uh, there's also the honey producers, uh, American honey producers and other uh, groups that you can attend events for. Now, my email, as I said, I put it up here, beekeeper at happybusybees.com, easy as anything. Or if you don't wanna send to that one, beeswarmrescue at gmail.com. Either of them will get to me. And as I said, if you want this presentation, just send me an email and uh, I will send it off to you. I'll also put you on my emailing list though. So when I'm gonna do something else, uh, you'll get a little blurb about it. Of course, you can always tell me, remove you from the email list and I'll do that. Some upcoming events that you might wanna know about. Um, I'm teaching a basic beekeeping class virtually. Uh, I try to teach one every month. My class uh, runs three Monday evenings for about two and a half hours each night. Uh, 15, 22nd and 29th of March will be my next class. It is one of six courses that the Colorado State Beekeeping Association uh, requires as the basic beekeeping course to, as the prerequisite to get into the master beekeeping program. So if you are thinking about doing additional education uh, in a master beekeeper program such as Colorado's, uh, you might wanna take my class or one of the other six classes or five classes that are listed on the CSBA website. Um, if you wanna register for my class, you can go to myhappybusybees.com. It costs $89. Uh, in two weeks, we have the next Wyoming Bee College uh, presentation. It'll be Honey Bee Nutrition by Sebastian Owen. That one's free, March 9th, 6.30. And there is the link to go sign up for that one. So there again, if you, if you can't copy that link quick enough, you're gonna to have to send an email and get the presentation. Uh, you register by completing a survey. Once you've completed the survey, you get the link. 
other upcoming events, I'm gonna have a free guide to installing nukes and packages. It, it only runs for about 25 to 30 minutes. It's gonna be March uh, the 11th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Here again, you can register on my website. It's free. We'll talk about how you install a nuke or a package. I saw that on the 10th of March, some other organization is having a free uh, install of nuke and packages also. So you can, if you can't make mine, uh, you might look on Facebook for the other one or vice versa. And then of course, Wyoming Bee College coming up uh, all day events on March the 20th with four top notch instructors talking about various topics uh, that are going on, uh, honeybee biology, types of hives, feeding and basic equipment for the bees and uh, buying bees and installing package or nuke. So, you know, you can attend my package or nuke installation first and then you can check out and see if Paul tells you the same way to do it or not. So, you know, it's always, you always can learn. And there again, you sign up with this uh, website or, or a link and you register by completing the survey too. So with that, I like to tell people just be calm and buzz along. Hopefully I've uh, enlightened you with some of my uh, missteps and some of the fables and um, myths that I believe are out there. So. At this point in time, I think we could probably take some questions uh, and uh, I love answering questions if I can. <clears throat> yeah, so anyone out there, if you've any question, you know, it's okay to try to stump the beekeeper. So you can you can ask any question you want on, on any beekeeping topic. You can unmute yourself if you want. You can put a question into chat, but uh, if you have any questions for Joe, uh, go ahead and ask them, and we'll see if uh, if uh, we can get it in, you know the question answered for you. Boy, all the people out there, and there are no questions. Hey, Joe. Uh, hey. My name's Tara. Um, so during the last session, we learned about all these fancy uh, honeybee breeds. Uh, do you have a particular breed that you prefer, or do you do you like the the wild swarms that you find? Well, you know, wild swarms are kind of a misnomer because most of the times, unless you have a lot of hollow trees where feral bees have been able to, uh, you know, make their way and and live for years and years, um, most of the swarms you find are some other beekeepers' uh, uh, bees that have swarmed because. They didn't uh, do any split uh, uh, swarm suppression by doing some splits and things like that. So more than likely, those swarms that you're finding in a lot of cases are just gonna be someone's Italians or Carniolans or whatever they happen to buy. But when we talk about breeds of bees, there again on the internet, you can find all types of tables talking about the traits of these different types of bees. And some people call them types, some people call them breeds, some people call them subspecies. But I told you earlier that I'm kind of, uh, you know, frugal. And, you know, if Italian bees are available in a package at the best price, I'm probably getting Italian bees. And, you know, people talk about Minnesota Hygienic and Saskrataz and uh, Purdue ankle biters and all these other type of bees that are going to possibly do better with the mites than some others. But there again, after one or two generations, especially if you're, uh, a colony happens to swarm, um, you dilute those genes very quickly. So, you know, most people start out with Italians because they're considered to be calmer and easier to work. Um, but, you know, uh, carnies, Italians, whatever you want to buy is probably fine because within a generation or two, they're probably all mutts. Um, not to say that, you know, there's, there's people who really think that the Russian bees are the best around, uh, you know, the Cordovans, Caucasians, there again, I'm gonna look for the best deal I can get if I'm buying bees at all. I try not to buy bees. I try to do splits of my overwintered bees. And in the past seven years, I think I've only bought four packages. But there again, it's all up to you on what you want to uh, use. Do a little research, read what other people have to say about the various types of breeds and make an informed decision. Uh, but you know, if, if cost is, is a factor, then uh, buy the package that, that's the, uh, the, the best deal for you. Now, one thing I will say is if you're buying bees, both packages and nukes have advantages and disadvantages. And of course, with a package, 
uh, you're going to have no comb. So very rarely are you going to get any diseases from elsewhere coming in. Uh, also, because there's no brood usually, <clears throat> you can do some mite treatments such as uh, oxalic acid vaporization or dribble to kill any mites that might be riding on the backs of the bees. And that way you can start out almost mite free. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, if you're buying a nuke, you're actually buying frames of wax that could possibly have disease in it. So you run that risk of getting disease from outside the area, unless all of those nukes are coming from the area itself. So there again, uh, things to consider, uh, you know, if you have built up comb already that you could put bees into, a package might be better. If you're starting from scratch, with all blank foundation, a nuke gives you a head start because you already have some wax built. So there again, there's pros and cons no matter which way you go, whether it's nuke or package, whether it's Italians, carnies or something else. And it's only up to you to decide what's the best course of action. So Joe, a couple questions for you here came through in chat. Um, I had actually a couple questions about wax moths. From Diane, okay. she says, I, I lost a colony to wax moths. Any issue in reusing the boxes or covers? I tossed some of the frames. Yeah, it's, and, believe it or um, not, those those wax my uh, those those wax moths, those larvae can actually eat the wooden frames. And uh, I've only had uh, I've only seen wax moths once, and and the wax moths that I saw actually were in a nuke. Uh, that was given to me to potentially put a swarm in by another beekeeper. And I didn't ever think about wax moths. And I left that nuke in the garage for, for a month or so. And when I got a swarm and I was ready to put the, the swarm for that person in the nuke, I opened it up and there was all these wax moth larvae and webs. And really, uh, in a lot of cases, you just want to take and pull the wax off. And you might be able to reuse the wooden frame and put some new uh, plastic uh, foundation in it. But other than that, there's not a lot of things that you can do to clean up. You don't really have to worry about it because once the winter comes, if you've frozen all the eggs, all the larvae is killed, they're usually not going to come back. Um, a lot of people say if you have frames that you're worried about wax moths on, you put them in the freezer for two or three days and it kills all the eggs and the larvae, and then you can reuse those. And uh, so for the most part, um, you know, clean it up as much as you can maybe put new foundation in and then go ahead and reuse them. But if they've really eaten away the, the wood, which they can do, uh, you might wanna replace the frame entirely. <clears throat> okay, and then, and then, um, it's kind of an interesting question because I've not seen this sort of question before. My nearby neighbors are pur purchasing mason bees, so orchard mason bees, should I be concerned? Well, you know, here again, there's controversy over honeybees and, you know, encroaching on the native bees. And it's interesting, if you look at bee biology, and I don't know if Carolina will talk about this when she's talking bee biology in a couple of weeks on the 20th of March, but the bee, the honeybee, has a proboscis, which is about a quarter inch long. Most of the native bees usually only have proboscises or tongues that are only about an eighth of an inch uh, to three sixteenths of an inch. So they can't go deeper into flowers. So the fact of the matter is the bees are generalists and can go to a lot of different flowers that a lot of the native bees like a mason bee cannot. So should you be concerned? Probably not because um, the native bees only usually uh, look and forage uh, a couple hundred feet from their nests. And remember we showed, showed that uh, graphic of the bees going up to two and a half miles away from home. So they're probably not gonna outcompete the mason bees in your backyard. Um, you know, the bees are gonna probably find bigger, better places to go to. So I don't think there's any reason to be concerned. And as I was telling Catherine uh, before we started, I have some sunflowers right off my deck. And over the last couple of years, I have seen at least 10 or 15 different type of native bees, bumblebees, flies, wasps, hornets, and honeybees going to those same flowers. So in most cases, you know, maybe the insects do a better job of just getting along than some humans do. And maybe we should take our cues from mother nature and, you know, 
just share and share alike and everyone just get along. <laughs> there we go. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. Are package and nuke bees required to be state inspected before they are sold to you? So in Colorado, at least now, Wyoming has some different laws and Wyoming actually has a, a handbook that tells you what you have to do to have bees in your apiary and everything else. But I can't sp speak much more to Wyoming than knowing that they do have a bunch of regulations. Here in Colorado though, we don't even have a state bee inspector, so to speak. The laws on beekeeping are very minimal, if not at all. So even if they required you to have a package inspected here in Colorado, I don't know who would do the inspection because technically we don't have anyone who does that because there's no funding in the state budget for that purpose. And in fact, last year, they repealed the Bee Act in Colorado because it hasn't been funded for more than 20 years. So if you don't fund the, the item, how are you gonna enforce it? So as far as I know here in Colorado, there is no type of inspection that occurs. Yeah, well, 20 years, okay. Um, Dawn has got her hand raised. So Dawn, go ahead and ask your question. Um, okay, so my bees are doing cleansing flights today and yesterday. And so there's poop all over the place and some dead bees. But I was just, cause like other years, I seemed like there was so much poop on my frames. And I just wondered if there's a way to know if you have nosema or it's just normal defecation. <laughs> so there again, you know, if they're defecating in the hive, usually that means they have a disease. Normally that would be considered nosema. But, you know, with nosema, you can actually get fumagillin and put it into sugar syrup and that'll help quell it. But you know, as soon as natural sources start coming in or you're even giving sugar syrup yourself and the weather is such that they can get out and do cleansing flights on a regular basis, usually the nosema clears up on its own. Although we're starting to see sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, if there's a lot of defecation inside the hive that usually indicates a problem, but most of the time it'll fix itself over time as the bees build up and the moisture in the area goes down. Okay. Um, I had a question here about sugar patties in the hive over winter. What are your thoughts about sugar patties in the hive for overwintering? Well, you know, here again, I do things differently than a lot of folks, even though I'm an average Joe. And I normally feed sugar syrup all year long on, unless I'm actually producing honey with sugar, uh, with honey supers on. So I have had front boardman feeders on my hives since November. And if you're using a two to one sugar syrup, that sugar syrup won't freeze until 17 degrees. And in our, uh, you know, thin air and, and intense um, sun, even if it gets below 17 degrees at night, as long as there's expansion room in my uh, jars on the front of my hive, uh, they won't crack. And as the sun comes up in the morning, uh, the sun being magnified by the glass jar actually melts the, uh, the, the frozen uh, sugar syrup uh, way before the bees might even be coming out to fly anyway. So by the time the bees are flying, it's usually at a temperature they could take. When I was doing inspections today, I found that the bees were backfilling empty comb uh, with the sugar syrup or nectar. And so therefore, if they have that sugar syrup, there's no need for me to have sugar patties. A lot of people like to put fondant, sugar patties, or even put granulated sugar in, which we call the mountain camp method. And if that works for them, that's great. But because I feed liquid most of the year, uh, I don't use those other types of sugars. Although uh, at this point in time, I'm starting to put spring patties in. My wife actually makes up the patties herself and she uses sugar, pollen substitute, water, and makes these little cakes that we put on the top of our inner cover and then put a shim so that the bees can go up and get the pollen and sugar if they want it. And usually we start putting that on around uh, mid-February. Okay, great, thanks. Um, from Paul Anderson, who owns Prairie Winds Bee Supply here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, his comment is, in Wyoming, any bees brought into the state are supposed to be inspected 
The bees I bring in receive an inspection from point of origin and upon arrival to the state. So in Wyoming, they are inspected. And then, so this is, you can tackle this one if you want, um, or we can just say this is a whole class unto itself. <laughs> I'm considering requeening a hive, okay? Is allowing the hive to swarm a viable method? Go for it, Joe. Well, it's viable, but it's not very um, nice to your neighbors, let's put it that way. Um, and the reason I say that is, when the bees swarm, they need to find a place to find a new home. Unfortunately, we don't find a lot of hollow trees uh, as cavities that they can move into. So more than likely, they're gonna move into the eaves of your neighbor's house or a local barn that's nearby. And then that's gonna become a problem as they build up. The neighbors won't know they're in there. And pretty soon when they're a year later, when they're a full colony and they're causing havoc for your neighbor, and your neighbor has to go pay some structural remover or extractor a thousand bucks to remove those bees from their house, the neighbor is not gonna be happy. And believe it or not, most swarms only go about 100 to 250 feet from their hive while they're looking for a new place to move to. And if possible, they try to move less than a quarter mile from the, the, the place of origin. So more than likely within a block or two of your house is where those that swarm is gonna alight and it can be a real problem for the neighbors. So a good beekeeper or a better beekeeper or a conscientious beekeeper, whichever you wanna call that beekeeper, will do the split. And when they do the split, if as I said, you create your own queen by letting the bees create the queen, then you have a new queen. And in fact, when I do splits, many times I'll have queen cells on three or four frames. And as I'm doing my inspections, because in the spring, I try to inspect every hive every week. I'll take one frame of uh, one frame that has queen cells and put it in a nuke with some nurse bees, another one in a different nuke with nurse bees, and then leave that third frame or whatever number of frames I have in the split itself. And now I have three potential queens that can go out and mate. Usually I have about 80% uh, effective mating rate. And what happens there is if the queen doesn't mate, I've got some backup queens that did mate. And if all is really good and everyone mates and I don't have to use those queens, I can actually sell some queens to people who are looking for queens. So I wouldn't just let them swarm. I would do a split because you're in control more so than if it's swarming. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, so from Debbie, and I'm gonna answer this in part and then I'm gonna hand the rest of it off to Joe. Sure. So Debbie, it says, do you have any type of temperature gauge inside of any of your hives in the winter to know when to insulate your hives? So there is some products out there. One of them is called Broodminder and there's a couple other companies out there where you can not only know the weight of your hive, but you can monitor the temperature and the humidity inside the hive and it's all Bluetooth linked and mm -hmm fiddle with it on your phone so it just depends how tech techno geeky you are with your beekeeping but joe do you want to answer the rest of that um insulating your hives so insulating sort of insulating is a very interesting topic and here again when i started remember i said that things we do here sometimes because of our dry weather and the altitude and things like that other people couldn't get away with one of the colonies that i lost this winter had a solid bottom board. Almost every one of my hives has a screened bottom board that I leave open all winter long. And I don't insulate my hives. And most of the time, my bees survive just fine. There's research that shows the bees can survive 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit for 40 hours, as long as they have honey to uh, consume so that they can shiver and create heat. So the bottom line is, um, you know, I don't really insulate my hives. This year, I tried something new and I actually built some windbreaks using hay bales because we posted on next door that if people had hay bales after um, Halloween that they wanted to get rid of, we would pick them up. And we literally got 30 or 40 hay bales from people who didn't know what to do with them anyway. And so I built wind blocks around all my hives on the north and the south. And that was really the only insulation I used. Now I do use a blanket, an insulation blanket on top of my inner cover. And 
Um, a lot of research shows that if you have insulation on the top of the hive, it kind of acts like a hat for people. Uh, when it's cold outside, if you just have a bare head, you lose heat from your head. But if you wear a, a cap or, or, or a, a stocking cap or something like that, or a hat, uh, you have less heat loss. And a lot of research is showing that if you have some kind of insulation on top of the hive, it creates less heat loss and it actually makes the cluster move up to the top and instead of being a sphere that has all that surface area, the bees tend to flatten out against the top once they move up there and there's less surface area to lose heat and they can actually insulate themselves better. So I don't do insulation, I don't do tar paper wrap, but instead I just do some insulation on the top and I can leave my uh, bottom boards open and, and nothing happens. But getting back to the bottom board, the one that had the solid bottom board, although that colony perished, uh, there was a lot of moisture in there because with the solid bottom board, they weren't able to dry off. Whereas any hives that I had that had uh, screen bottom boards, those bees were dry and there wasn't moisture. So in this climate, I believe that a solid bottom board uh, keeps more moisture in the hive and wet bees that are cold are worse than cold bees. And so I'm tending to think I may get rid of all of my solid bottom boards and only have screen bottom boards. Okay, that's that's interesting. I, I, I'm in Wyoming and the wind blows a lot. And so I always worry about that huge draft coming up underneath their skirt, so to say. So I used to have a solid bottom board under mine, but I also live in Wyoming and our rules up here are different. So- Well, Joe, you know, the other thing is basic <laughs> thermodynamics tells us that if you don't, if you have, hot air inside of a volume and there's no way for that hot air to get out the top. Like there's some people who like to use upper entrances. If you have upper entrances then that heat can leave and then cold air can come up in. Yep. But if you don't have upper entrances and the, and the air inside the hive is there, thermodynamics will tell us that the outside air can't come in because you kind of have a temperature inversion much like we have in the mountains sometimes and uh, the bees can actually keep the inside of the box warm. Okay, um, <laughs> a couple more questions here. You're sure. on Aaron. Um, says, I, I, how do you prep used and or abandoned Langstrom hives for new bees? Looks like you bought some at an auction, so lucky him, how fun. But what do you do? You do anything special for used hives so that you're not transferring any viruses over? So if you're concerned about American fall brood, which is the one that most people are concerned about, um, you have to torch the insides of the boxes themselves so that you actually burn up the spores. So that if there was any American fall brood in there, you wouldn't have to worry about the box transmitting that fall brood. But when it comes to frames and wax. There really is no way to clear out the disease from the frames and the wax. So there again, if you got frames that had foundation on it, I would suggest removing the foundation, uh, maybe melting the wax off of it for making candles or something. But you know, putting new foundation in there, either wax foundation or plastic foundation. Uh, the uh, frames themselves, the wooden frames, they can be scorched with that propane tank that we showed earlier. Uh, and therefore, make sure that you're killing anything there. And that's about it. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot more you can do uh, because there's not a whole lot more moving parts. Okay, thanks. And then a question. So if you wanna keep your hives at a minimum, say you only want two or three at a maximum over the years, how do you manage that? Especially if you're doing splits. So here's the thing. There's always people who didn't order a package or a nuke and want to get into beekeeping in the spring and all of a sudden realize they can't get bees anywhere. If you're doing splits and you don't have a place to put those hives, you can make nukes out of those and sell late season nukes in the, in the late May, early June timeframe. And you're probably going to find takers for those nukes. And it's the first time ever in a hobby that a lot of money goes into that you may actually get some money back. Now, the other alternative is to find a hive host location. Now, when I was talking about orienting the bees and I had that little picture of the six hives there that were orange and blue, 
That is one of my high post locations. That's the Denver Bronco Training Center. I have six hives that I keep at the Denver Broncos Training Center. They're high posts for me. What I do is I keep my bees there. I uh, collect the honey. I give them about 10% of the honey that they use on the training table and I get to keep the rest. And I get to say that I'm the beekeeper for the Broncos. So if you're doing splits and you don't have room of your own to keep those hives, find someone who wants to help the bees but doesn't want a beekeeper and put the hives on their property. But a caution, four hives can become eight, eight can become 24, 24 becomes 50. And all of a sudden you're doing a lot of bee work on a regular basis. So, you know, if you don't want to get into it that deep, uh, you know, consider selling some nukes to other folks in May and June, and I'm sure you'll find takers. Okay, hey, so one last question before we close off for the evening, and it's from Lauren. It says, on swarms, have you had any luck catching a swarm by setting up a bait hive or empty hive? So I always put swarm traps or, or swarm hives uh, in every one of my apiaries so that if I am not doing a good job or I miss the signs and they do swarm, hopefully they'll go to one of my traps. In all the seven seasons so far that I've had beehives, I've put up those hive traps or, or you know, swarm bait or whatever you want to call it. In all my apiaries, I've only caught three of my own swarms. Now, I don't know if that's because I haven't had a lot of swarms because I do a lot of splitting or if I just didn't know that they swarmed and they didn't happen to pick my location. But the way I put it is, if you catch one of your own swarms, great. You know, you didn't lose those bees. Um, but uh, I haven't been real successful in catching swarms in my swarm traps. But, you know, there again, maybe it's because I've done a good job of splitting. Uh, but then again, even though I'm a master beekeeper, when I got my master beekeeping certification, somebody bought me a t-shirt that says master of bees. And I made the mistake of wearing that to the apiary one day, even though it was under my jacket, the bees could read it and they put me in my place very quickly saying, you are not the master of us, we are the master of you. And that's the way you really got to look at it. The bees are going to do what the bees are going to do. And no matter what I think I know, as soon as I'm getting too big for my britches, the bees put me in my place very quickly. And that's what beekeeping really is all about. Mother nature taking its course and you just trying to help out along the way. Well, Joe, those are some great answers and had some great questions from everybody. And uh, I certainly had fun tonight and enjoyed your talk. And I've learned quite a bit myself. And I look forward to the beekeeping season. And to everybody who's here, thank you for attending. And the next one coming up is it's in March. It is March 9th. I'll send reminders out for that one, of course. So everybody have a uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy and uh, be calm and buzz along. So Joe, yeah. thank you for tonight. And thanks sure everybody. Enough. Have a good evening. And yeah, the presentation's recorded and I'll make it available for everybody. So good night. Good night.